just like all right good evening everyone we will go ahead and get started uh for those listening in um karen bigelow and jessica are out of town will not be here tonight justin actually will be virtual is he online justin can you hear us okay i can hear you great thank you so when you want to speak all you have to do is put a note in the chat kristen will catch it and it will hit your button for me so i know you're there okay thank you thank you all right any questions about the update agenda tonight any questions about the formal agenda tonight uh, just so that i know um, we have one um, item that kathy will be taking the autism acceptance month um, we have one action item is anyone interested in reading that item tonight um you know i'd like to uh if you don't mind i'd like to read the uh, autism awareness resolution if that's okay with you kathy actually i have a pretty strong personal connection to it myself uh, I do as well. My daughter was just diagnosed with autism. I have a family member. So I, I'll call on Kathy to read it, and then I'll call on you first, Justin, for comments after Kathy reads it. Is that okay? Sure. Since so she brought it forward. What is the action? Um, action item 12A is uh, taking opposition to uh, House Bill 2013. Uh, I'll take that. Okay. I just want to make sure I know who to call on. All right, moving on to briefings. Well, we have staff updates. Go ahead, Brett. <laughs> Thanks, Mayor. A few comments. Um, something I'm trying to do a look ahead just to help council because the look ahead is constantly changing. I'm trying to move around different priorities, bring forward discussion that council wants to discuss. Also balance that with the business that we have to do as well in the different council meetings. Um, but what I want to try to do is bring a little bit of the, the reasoning why and take note of some different things that are going back and forth so council understands where stuff is moving to on the agenda. So it's make more sense once I get into it. So for example, um, recently we talked about the parks and recreation fee increases and there was some follow up that was needed as far as um, the active bill board um, costs and getting them to come in here and talk about that. So the sports fees and then the golf uh, fee changes. So that'll be coming back on 416 at that planning session. So you know, that's, that's scheduled for follow up. Uh, another one was with the board and commission um, feedback. So. Uh, Joseph has been going out and meeting um, most recently with like Tashco talking about the different board and commission proposed changes the council had discussed. That's going to be coming back to you on 423. Um, and all these are on the look ahead now if you download that look ahead and, and take a look at it. Um, and then we removed one item and previously when we remove items from the look ahead, they just disappear. But I wanted to kind of bring attention to it just so you know, you know, the reasoning why something might disappear. And so in this one, it was a little bit further out, but it was for chapter 46 of the city code related to parks and recreation. Um, there's a court uh, case right now that may is related to urban camping and what municipalities can do to enforce it, but that may impact kind of what we are trying to do within Chapter 46. So we didn't want to bring forward a code, have this court ruling, and then have to bring forward it again to make those modifications. So we removed it from right now just to wait for that hearing or the case to resolve, and then we'll bring that forward again. So that's why it disappeared from the agenda for right now, but it'll, it'll eventually come back. And there wasn't necessarily anything pressing that we had to do at this moment to bring it forward. Um, one other item that was somewhat related, look ahead, uh, we had an executive session several weeks ago on fire union negotiations. Obviously, I can't really talk and open um, specifically regarding those, but I wanted to mention that there was the possibility of bringing that back to council in executive session if there were some key points that we were still trying to debate over with the union. Um, I'm happy to say that the negotiations have been going well on both sides, so thanks to both the fire union and our staff. Um, there's a couple of small items left that they kind of expect to get wrapped up in agreement on it tomorrow. So there just wasn't a need to come back to council in exact session to try to figure out how do we resolve this, this issue between the two parties. So good news there, but that's kind of the, um, what I'll try to keep you updated on again as the look ahead changes in the future. <clears throat> and then one other item that I wanted to mention completely unrelated to the look ahead um, relates to the Thornton Water Project. On the consent calendar tonight, I know we have a lot of items, but there's actually four agenda items related to different um, IGA's license agreements that we have with a couple different towns um, as you go up into Weld, uh, Weld County. And I wanted to um, mention that this was really, a, you know, um, kudos to staff. This has been many years in the making to come to this final agreement. And it just shows the kind of the good neighbor policy that we've been operating under. We never forced our way through. Uh, we were operating in good faith throughout this entire time and came to an agreement that I think um, not only benefits these specific towns, but also, you know, obviously works for the city of Thornton as well for what we're trying to accomplish with the Thornton Water Project. So, um, just want to note that we came across the finish line on that item and it's on consent, but um, it was a good news story. Finally, and then I'm going to shut up, is um, tomorrow night is our first meeting with the Larimer County Planning Commission. So this is for the Thornton Water Project 1041 land use application in Larimer County. Um, so we're kicking that off tomorrow night. 
It's the planning commission, so it's not the final vote, but they'll ultimately provide that recommendation to the board of county commissioners, which we'll see in about two weeks. So um, lots of exciting things happening related to the Thornton Water Project, and I'll be keeping you updated as we get information from them. Thank you. I know I spoke quick, but any questions on that? Yes, Kathy. Do you think, uh, for the benefit of the public during the regular meeting, that before the consent calendar is uh, read, or is it, I don't know, are items going to be read from it tonight? The consent uh, calendar. The ordinance titles are read. Okay. Is there a t is there a point where maybe staff could you could make a statement about the IGAs and and the work coming to fruition with staff and Weld County so that people public, the public who are listening could know that we're making progress. You think that's worthwhile? Maybe ask the question from a legal standpoint. Is it does it put us at risk to say anything at this point? No, that'd be fine. Type of summary that Brett just made. All right, I can call on you just to give an overview before we take the vote. Can you hit your button, Roberta? All right, I should move to it. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, anything from you, Tammy? No, not tonight. All right, we will jump into briefings. Uh, so we have two youth event funding requests and a nonprofit funding request. A lot of nonprofit requests. Ah, uh, yes. Thank you, Mayor and members of City Council. Um, we actually had a chance to kind of bunch these requests this time, and so we're fortunate from that standpoint. I I am um, not going to go through the background. You've heard it uh, several times, and all the background does is just provides. Uh, why we're doing this and the council policy that directs this process. The um, there, There's the youth event is a different policy than the other. Uh, so we have two youth requests. You've seen uh, these uh, teams before uh, last year. Uh, the, um, the school is uh, actually notified us on Friday that they have they may have one or two more and uh, requests that they're gonna submit. And unfortunately, they uh, they won't get to the city council in time prior to the, to the actual event, but they will come to city council anyway and they would just be a retroactive if, um, uh, if you consider it at that point. But they're right, right now, we, we have not received them. But when we do, they will be yeah. on, uh, we have some items coming the first, meeting in May, first uh, planning session, I believe. Um, so these two, um, these two young uh, people, you've uh, some of them are actually the same students that you've seen in the past. And both of these teams are going to the Vex, Vex Robotics World Championship in Dallas, Texas. And they have both submitted requests under the team category. Um, and so that's what you have for uh, re youth requests for this point in time. I don't, didn't know if you wanted well, you we'll want do, to go we through We can do that all. one first. Uh, right, any objection to the two youth requests? No. Okay. And that's six, that's per team, 600 per team. Correct. Right. Yeah. The next uh, set of uh, slides, uh, the first uh, group is the Growing Home. And these are the events that they have uh, uh, laid out for this year as part of their fundraising uh, process. There's uh, three events. Last year, uh, the city contributed at the uh, sponsorship level to the uh, Fiesta program. And then the other programs were just, um, uh, there was the individual participation. So the city sponsored the it's the food one. The, yeah, there it is. The Esther one, number five. Um, so there are those three events. And the last one on that page is the Early Childhood Partnership of Adams County ECPAT. They have an annual breakfast. Um, and the city last year uh, uh, was a sponsor of that event as well. The next page is uh, again, a group that you saw last year, the Stout Street Foundation. They're actually located in Commerce City and they provide uh, health services. Uh, and um, they're really the only entity up in this Northern part of the area. This is the same event that city council uh, approved a, a sponsorship level 
Uh, the next one is the Rocky Mountain Partnership. This is their annual State of the Partnership uh, event. And last year was the first year that, I think it was the first year that City Council was also a sponsor of that event. And then the last um, item, number nine, is a new request from the Romito Foundation uh, it, it, um, Mr. Romito is actually a um, uh, Thornton police officer, and uh, this is a, an event that is really to advocate for um, not the health. The Shanes. Yes. Oh, the Shanes. Yeah. Right? And, yeah, it's a um, pretty a wicked uh, disease for children. And so that is a new request. Um, and if you have any questions, I'll try and answer those for you. You can go back if you want to look at. Should we start with growing home? There's three requests there. I believe the last time we said no to the golf classic because it was in Littleton. It's also while we're in DC. So just That's four tickets would yeah. be something we we give to staff or something like that, right. I would think. Or for the people not going August to August. Yeah, what I don't know if when are you coming back? It's the thirteenth and the fourteenth, I think is the Right, that's the twelfth or the fifteenth. Yeah. You're coming. We'll come okay. back to fifteen. So we're thinking about yes for the for number three and maybe yes for number five, but not for number four since we will since is that what you're saying? Because no, number three is here. the one we won't be. Number here three is when you Oh, sorry. Oh, I was looking at August 15th. Right, right. So okay. we do individuals for people who aren't going to DC for number three. Okay. And then four and five are up for discussion. And five we did last time as well because it was more local. Yeah, I mean, if we're not going to do three, I definitely want to do four and five. I mean, or two, if we did number three or four, some tickets would probably get used. It's not by council members. Right. Are we okay with four and five? Well, I, well, I, I think I think we're pro tem also to support number three because we had talked about three about um, uh, sponsorship uh, support. Well, let's come back to that one and talk to the rest of them. Okay. Um. So number six, ECPAC. Yes, please. Three hundred dollars a month. Right. Did everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. All right. South Street Foundation. Again, similar issue, golf tournament in Littleton. Oh, it's in Littleton. But it's in May. But they but they provide services in our... They do. Do we know how many Thornton residents they've helped? Uh, it's a, a small number and they don't... Uh, uh, and so it's really kind of an estimate of the number of, of people that they serve because they tend not to um, keep track of or want to provide specific information. And so... It, it's a small number. They have other events too, don't they? So I believe we have uh, more South than Street that. last year had one other event and then they ended up canceling it. Mm -hmm. um, and so the city event signed up for that, but that was the money was returned. So maybe on that one, we can see who's available to go because it looks like you can't buy individual tickets. You can only do a foursome. A foursome is not that significant of an investment, really. I mean, Right, but the question is, do you do a, a foursome or do you do a sponsorship? Right. I mean, just thinking if, if we're not. So let's hold that one and see who's available for it. And if we have enough to go do a foursome, we could. So the direction is who's available for a foursome. Yeah, we'll come okay. and we'll come back and see to council, make sure we're good with that. Okay. If for some reason eight people go, we figure it out from there. <laughs> Um, all right, Rocky Mountain Partnership. I support that. Everybody okay with that? The Romito Foundation? Everybody okay with that? Yeah. Where, where are they based? Is it, or is it well, it, it's, it, it, the Romito Foundation is actually an individual. It, and I, I I believe they're based out of that person's home. Okay. And they provide, they actually coordinate services on a volunteer basis to the other family members who have children with the Duchenne uh, disease. 
my understanding is that's a completely different event this year than they've done in the past. In the past, it was kind of a tasting of of beer and liquor. And now I think it's going to be a dinner to, to kind of bring it to a different level of support. I'm not opposed. I'm just curious, do they provide, as a nonprofit, do they share out how they spend their resources? They uh, indicated they, they provide uh, service to one family that's in Thornton. And they they actually, uh, at least the way he described it, it, it's really a volunteer support for the family members. And so that they do a couple of things. They will provide outings for the children because that's not easy for them to get out right. and they need additional help. Uh, and then they will also provide uh, uh, respite care for the parents and just, you know, it, essentially that's because they're volunteers and that's how they're providing their service by on kind of a one-on-one -on -one basis in this as they know the family members. Yeah, the objection? Things. Go ahead. No objection, but a few other things to note, the ice cream social is, uh, for Ward 2 is the same evening as the Romita Foundation, so if you're trying to plan or for that, Thank you. Then uh, Ward 3 community meeting is during the Rocky Mountain Partnership event. Ah, so on November just, 21st. I, you know, that yeah. RMP event, you could actually, it, last year it started, I think, at 3, even. So I think there's a part, an opportunity to, to go. And I, I don't know, I can't speak to what their schedule is <laughs> in this November, but there may be an opportunity to participate in, in, a, portion, in, the, in a portion of the event. Um, before attending the meeting. I believe it's more informal kind of event. It's not like a, a, not a sit plated down. meeting, not a sit down, and it's really uh, to present their their plan for the uh, future and then to... There, there is a sit down portion to this it. This time? So I think, are we okay with that then? I'm fine. No, I'm just no just issues. for anybody that's right. attending. Yeah, no, I still need some work. Yeah, still need some all right, then back to Growing Home Golf Classic. Should we treat that the same as the other golf tournament, see who's available before we decide on sponsorship? Bring those both back. When we, yeah, yeah, how soon do they need, how soon are they asking for a response? That's a June 14th, so we have time. Yeah, and we can, we'll, just, uh, we'll just send information or request out to council. Okay, we can talk about it next week. So we'll bring back the two golf ones next week when we know who's available. Okay. And, and where are we in our, do we have a, what's our budget for sponsorships? Well, the total budget for youth, uh, schools, and sponsorships is 40000 Okay. I think... Um, if all of these uh, were approved, it pulls up to trying to get to the bottom here. Uh, Twenty five thousand. That that's everything that uh, the commitments made. that we've made already. You mean it takes twenty five? Would take, that's including everything we've already approved this so far right. this year? Okay. All right. Well, I'm comfortable. Yeah, I don't. I don't think we're going to break the bank supporting that all of these, but if you want to find out about the golf classic, I understand. You want to make sure people can kind of come the guess. All right. All right. Four, five, and six, are they all okay? Yes. I think we got everything. The two golf tournaments are the first ones to make sure. Those we are follow-up. Okay. Even if we don't go to the golf tournaments, we could still make a donation. We just wouldn't be a sponsor at the event, per se. Or do they have, these are the, these are the only levels of the golf. Sponsorship donation available. Um, I'm sure they would be happy to take uh, your your any contribution you want to make to them. And if well, you well, I'm just thinking, if, I mean, if we don't do, if we don't support at a golf at a foursome level, you know, if we made a donation, would they still would our logo still be part of the you know on scene at the event? You know, because that's that's something uh, you can say. I'm sure that we could talk to them about that. And they would, but they would. They would probably be happy to do that. Okay. Well, we can find out who is available for the golf out at golf uh, tournaments, and then have further discussion from there. Got it. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, we will move on to the next item, which is discussion of proposed regulations concerning abandoned shopping carts. Good evening, Mayor, uh, Council Members. I'm Mike Garrett, Planning Director. Joining me this evening is Mike Hankinson. He's the Code Compliance Manager, and Julie Jacoby is the Economic Deputy Economic Development Director. She's in the back. If you have some questions about economic development aspect of this. Um, so what we're looking at is a presentation. It's addressing uh, the ongoing issue of abandoned shopping carts in the city and how those could be mitigated. The discussion will include a brief background, uh, community impacts of public nuisance alternatives, and community regulations and recommendations for staff. So basically, uh, abandoned shopping carts have become a growing nuisance, not only in Thornton, but nationally. Uh, abandoned carts impact <coughs> public and private properties. Uh, you often see them in the public areas, or more often you see it in private areas, although we have those issues as well. Essentially, when they're left and, and retrieved, the carts block sidewalks, they roll into streets, they run into parked vehicles, um, they impact drainage ways, natural areas, um, and they're often usually utilized by unhoused individuals. So they often collect their uh, items. You'll see those in the photos that we have. It's like those photos above you. Additional background. Um, in response to uh, this ongoing issue, uh, the staff here uh, did outreach uh, to local uh, national and local retailers um, in a series of meetings. So we can achieve economic costs and they actually have to go back to the corporate level and say you can purchase a hundred and seven parts of uh parts in your security. We don't know what that could do to uh prior best to your ability to help currently be fairly easy to search with you think some of the type of uh interesting enough uh some people require GPS parts and these parts to be able to come out there we're not proposing that kind of um one of the missions when we talk about retailers uh their concern is to see to see fines I mean, it's damages for the fact that they don't have to have up their property that's that is sort of common with the actually said fines they they pick them up uh they feel that they're the right to have that property so they take that back there to the starting as a branch Retailers have reported that they tried numerous techniques to keep the carts on site. Uh, everything from uh, signage that people sure. take carts off site. They've actually installed underground fencing and uh, implements to the carts to take various layers of implements and uh, both periodic that are out there. That is bizarre. We can't do that. Uh, they've tried blocking devices, which essentially just been similar to the broad fence and basically locks the cart out back in the city for parameter. But folks have figured it out to pick up the cart before it hits the barriers. So, um, a lot of communities are requiring one. They found it very manufacturing and product strategy. And specifically, it's a full type of cart. That, that's been an issue with itself. Um, so, the response. Employers have actually uh, contracted with uh, individual companies to actually survey uh, neighborhoods and communities throughout the, the, the nation, for example, and return the carts directly to the retailers. Uh, it's it's a decent approach, um, but it only it only impacts those who are willing to go out and do that themselves and have the ability to do that themselves, such as their larger retailers like Target and consumers, those things like that. They have the ability to do that because their economy of scale for them. They just have so many carts that are engaged that part. Uh, we did discuss what would it look like if the city had a hired uh, contractor, similar to those processes where we'd have a contractor uh, converts the city looking for abandoned carts, probably on a weekly basis, so, and return those carts directly to the retailers. Uh, they were very supportive of that concept. Uh, they were curious about how much that would cost. And I'll get to that when we got some feedback on potential costs on that later in the presentation. Uh, but that was of uh, interest to them. Uh, very interested not being fined is really kind of what that, the story was as we were kind of pulled by the retailers. Um, 
So under current regulations, uh, unattended carts um, on private properties could be a code violation. Uh, we could technically cite them as a trash or rubbish violation on the property. Uh, in some cases, we found that individuals will contact uh, the retailer and say and tell them they have a cart on their property. Can you please pick it up? Sometimes the retailers will, other times they won't. In often cases, they'll just push those carts out to the sidewalk. And to respond to that, our city crews generally pick those carts up, put them in the back pickup, and drop them off at the retailers. Is is typically how that occurs. Rarely do retailers come out to get carts. Um, one of the reasons that when we talk to them about that is they're really concerned about their employee safety of going out the streets, um, even the sidewalks is a concern for them. So basically, once it leaves any level of their property, they've really resisted on getting uh, any of those carts because of that potential impact. Um, getting to public property, including parks, open spaces, right of ways, um, city tests, basically city staff is routinely picking those up. In the last two weeks, uh, Mike Hankinson's crew and I, we asked to kind of do a survey and surveillance of how many carts are out there, how many we were picking up. Last two weeks, we picked up, I believe, 41 carts, 40, 44 carts, and uh, and return those to the retailer. So um, we are we typically pick them up, put them in the back of a truck, use the city, city uh, employees doing that, and they're dropping them off to the retailers. That was in one week? That was in two weeks, over a two-week period. So two weeks, 20, 44 two weeks. cards. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So about 22 cards a week. Okay. Um, just for reference, we, we were trying to get a baseline to understand what it would be like for a contractor if we had them go out and pick up cards, what, what the kind of volume of card okay. of work that we'd have for that. So, um, you know, part of the request is is defining shop, abandoned shopping carts, public nuisance. Uh, most communities, and we find that the abandoned carts um, should be picked up by the retailers. So they shouldn't be left to be off premise. Uh, so the two parts of the code that we'd be looking to to have go forward would be part of it would be to make it a public nuisance that they are abandoned carts, and then do have uh, requirements that the retailer does actively try to try to get those carts themselves. But if not, they'll have an option to uh, to look at a, a potentially a public uh, contractor to pick it up. But going back to this particular aspect, we're looking at creating a public nuisance. Uh, park car, carts do. Uh, create hazards to the public safety and welfare to the residents of the city. Um, they can be a nuisance. They do contribute to blight conditions when we assess blight. If you have those, you know, when you go down corridors, you see that kind of activity does, does contribute to the blight aspects of the community. Um, and it's just a safety concern as well. So regulatory response, um, uh, the intent is that potentially new regulations would require the retailers to properly remove mm -hmm. their lost, stolen, or abandoned shopping carts. Uh, the regulation would be, and this is not a, a, a abnormal for many other communities, basically one hour after the closing hour, their 24 hour businesses usually try to surveil twice over 24 hour period. We don't have that many 24 hour businesses anymore. Um, so most would be an hour afterwards to go out and look at them for the carts. We did talk to the retailers about that. They were not concerned about that aspect, but a lot of the carts end up being in apartment complexes and things way far away. We're not asking them to go out of the area just adjacent to their property to do that. And, you know, uh, we'd also encourage the uh, the retailers that do provide the carts to find solutions, continue to look at their own processes and how they can mitigate to on-site as much as they can. They're continuously looking for other advancements. Some community, uh, some retailers like Walgreens are modifying their type, type of carts they'll have. Some will use like a PVC pipe so they can't get out the door even. Um, and retailers, safe Safeway, for example, they're looking at it, having a two-tiered type carts. So you don't have, you can't put as much stuff in those. It's less attractive. They said they're the unhoused folks to have carts like that. So they're looking at those options. And then alternatives. So this is what uh, we're looking as a potential. And this is a partnership with the retailers. So this and, and is, an op is an opportunity that we thought, A, uh, not assess fines to retailers for having abandoned carts, but instead look at options to address the nuisance issues. And the first we look at uh, individual corporate retailers, um, they could choose to pick up their own carts, either with their staff or hired contractor. If they choose such an option as this, they'd work with our staff so we'd know who that contractor is. So we don't have redundancy in services potentially. And uh, just, it kind of gives that check in the balances too, if they, for whatever reason, they're not, they're not, uh, we find there's a ton of their carts out there that we can let their uh, store know that, that we're not seeing the performance that we expect out of their, that particular contractor. And the second option it would be available would be a city option. 
uh, we'd look at uh, having a contractor hired. Uh, we'd work with the retailers on uh, getting them signed up uh, to what we call an opt-in uh, for this particular service. Um, we'd look at potentially based on 22 carts, it'd probably be one time a week, we'd have a contractor go out, pick up carts. They, when I, re when I reached out to a couple companies to do this, uh, they said it takes about two hours to do that many carts. So two or three hours. Um, the estimated cost that I did get back from a couple of the vendors was between three to $500 a week. And we'd look at having the retailers reimburse the city cost at a per cart basis. And that'd run somewhere between 15 to like $30 per cart. And just for reference, the average cart cost anywhere on the low end of $400 to over a thousand dollars a cart. Um, so most of them were very supportive of that. It became an economy of scale aspect because if you're a small vendor, and you try to have a say you only have a handful of carts. If you had your own vendor go out to pick them up, they'd probably charge them somewhere around $150 to pick up a cart because they may only have one cart to pick up versus having us picking up 22 carts potentially and then spreading that among all the vendors. Uh, we, of course, have to do an RFP if we do that on a PAL. Uh, but the program really is designed to be a pass through cost. There would be, so the city wouldn't be absorbing new costs per se, but they would just basically we'd, we'd pay the contractor and we'd be reimbursed by the retailers directly. And if the ordinance was, was to be a pass, we'd be working with contractors, with the retailers and kind of the ones that were not as engaged in this process to explain the, 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 the program as we move forward. We'll have to reach out to all of them to do this. So it's a significant outreach we'd have to do as part of this as we work through the RFP aspect of this. Justin uh, has a question. Sure. Online. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so I think I'm I'm following this, but my question is, so if a retailer opted out of this program and what happens to their carts if they opt out, does the city collect them and return them anyway? Does the city not collect them? I'm not following what happens if some retailers opt out and some retailers are opting in. So council member Martinez, that's a great question. So if they opt out, that's it. They basically have taken their own responsibility to make sure those carts retrieve themselves. So they, they have, they've established that they have an employee that's, that does that for them or they have a, their own contractor. So that, that'd be the opt out aspect of it. Okay. But they've already established that they're willing to not go collect them because they're all over the city right now. So if they opt out, we already know that they're comfortable with losing the cards. Um, so if they if they opt out, then will those cards just not be collected? Because they're not already, they're right now, status quo is they're not collecting them. You said so yourself that they are not doing that because they de deem it too risky for their staff to go out there and collect carts. So what happens to the carts then if they're not opting into our program? So so at that point, uh it's an interesting scenario. That's that's a third one category, I guess, is you'd have uh we could certainly so if they're opting out, let me just step back. Opting in is we've talked to the retailer, they said we're small, we'd love to be part of the program so we don't have to hire a contractor. So we pay whatever it's fifteen dollars, whatever if you have a card every so often. Opting out means you have your own program. You already have something you're going to do. If you have somebody that says we want to do nothing, none of the above, then we have to. Um, then we have to. We'd probably be returning the cards at some level, um, or or if they're not definable um, through the vendor, they they could potentially be disposed. We do have some, but we try to reach out to every potential card owner as we can. But uh, but the small mom pause that businesses, that's one we definitely want to talk to about the opt-in aspect because I think it'd be beneficial to them versus is it essentially opting out is means you have your own program. So we're basically giving you two options, either you're in or you're out. And if you're out, you're just going to do your own thing, which is fine for most, you know, liquor store, for example, said we will, we can easily pick up our cards. They don't go anywhere. So, well, I, I, the, way I, the way I am understanding this is opting out doesn't necessarily mean they have their own program. Opting out could also mean they're just okay with the status quo of losing their carts. And so, but that doesn't help us. That still means the carts are out there. And, and what I don't like is the idea of they opt out 
but we're going to go retrieve their carts anyway. That negates the whole program because why would somebody opt in if they know that we're going to go get their carts anyway? That that doesn't make a sense from a business perspective. And that's entirely how all of these stores are going to treat it. They're only, their primary concern is their business. So our our concern is the nuisance carts in the in the city. So I want to make sure that we have that fleshed out and understood um, and that we keep the cart retrieval <clears throat> the the centerpiece of this program. And my, my next question is uh, with the um, with the program that we're proposing here, what kind of agreement would be signed or uh, agreed upon between the city and the con and and the contractor and the stores? And um, would that be individualistic for each resident, or would it be a blanket agreement across all all uh, retailers? And how would that that agreement work? Uh, legally, and how would it how would it be uh, enforceable? Okay, so so starting with the the discussion of how who would be who would be the opting in folks that that that'd be the individual retailers. Uh, we because we wouldn't we couldn't just blanket everybody and have everybody opt in. Although we could have some type of form we create that be similar to all, all is an opt-in type application for, or not really an application, basically saying how you're going to retrieve your cards or how if you're going to agree that the city returns your card. We haven't really developed that type, that type of registry yet, but that'd be something we'd look to do. Yeah, uh, what, what I was asking is, would there be an, a, a customized agreement between each retailer or would we write a generic contract that each one would sign? I think we'd write a generic uh, contract that each retailer could sign that set forth, you know, the liability of each party and the cost and the terms and conditions of us doing this service. So, yeah, we'd have a standard form, most likely. Okay. Thank you for answering my questions. Roberta. Um, what does it look like if there's stuff on the carts? It's a great question. So if if the contractor, so if it's, let's say it's a homeless encampment that we're dealing with, the generally these contractors will not return those cards unless they're emptied out. So we still have to probably use our, uh, our subcontractor that deals with abatements for those type of things to empty the cards, the bare minimum. And then the other contractor could return those cards at that point. A lot of the event retailers, we talk to them a lot of times, they're engaged in homeless encampments. They don't want the cards back because the cleaning and everything else, a lot of times are damaged. They just don't want, they, they prefer not having the cards back. Most cases. So then, does the city have to dispose of those cards? That's often what happens. Okay. So there wouldn't be inter any interaction between this type of company and an unhoused individual who, I mean, there wouldn't be like any weird interactions, right? No, they, uh, when I've talked to other communities that has a program similar to this, they, yeah, they, their contractors will not engage in that. Those, they have to be empty cards basically sitting out. So pick up. Can you treat them like cars? Like, can we tow cars and just pick all of them up, impound them, and charge a fee to get them back? That is regardless of whether they opt in or not. Just treat them all the same. And that's some communities do have. They have to. They have to have an essentially a impound lot, shall we say, for carts. Um, some communities do like Lone Tree, and it's rather large. And I'll go in a minute why it is. Um, but yes, that could be done as well, and they could come pick them up. We just have we'd have to find a facility for that. So that could be another window. Uh, that we're the ones that opt out or don't opt in, maybe that's the alternative. Is we just pick them up and right. Know, say, yeah, there, there needs to be. Yeah, I, I don't. I, I'm concerned the same thing that Councilmember Martinez brought up. If, if, if people opt out, and then we still have carts all over the place, it's still our problem. Yeah. And I mean, it, it, I'm sure they've crunched the numbers about what is most cost effective and beneficial for them. But I think that, yeah, an option for any retailer should not be if they opt out that they don't have to deal with, yep. uh, that there's no consequence 
that not trying to be punitive, but just saying that there's no consequence for them not participating. That's a good point. Roberta. Um, yeah, are there ways to like make certain retailers of a certain size that have a certain amount of carts or something like make it a requirement that they opt in? We could, um, I could let you know the free market right now is they're, they're already having contracts with companies themselves. Um, so like, like a retailer, a big box would have a, a contract with a company that would go find their car. So they'd be the, they potentially be opt out because they're going to use their own contractor. Versus oh, using okay. The contract so they them. either would have to like, could, could that be something where it's like, you're either, cause I could see like a small liquor store with a couple of carts. Yeah, whatever. But like when we have these larger retailers that have like huge amounts of cards all over, um, could we like require them to either opt into our program or have their own? That's what the code would require, yeah. Okay, so that's have, what it would, okay. Yeah, so you, that's really what the goal of the code is. Either you have two options, either you're opting in or not oh, opting, okay. you're opting out, you're gonna have your own program. So basically we're, we're the idea is we're creating a program that's not that expensive for people because if they had to pick up our abandoned carts that had abandoned them, we'd probably have to charge them $40 $50 just to pick them up. So it'd actually be cheaper for us to return them directly to these individuals than to have them come pick them up. Okay. So we're really going to try to encourage people to go that route than any type of storage slot. And we can avoid that. I yeah. found that other communities really struggle with that aspect of it because they just sit there. They never get picked up. Okay. Because they start compounding fines on top of them. And that becomes a challenge too. Okay. Tony? couple questions if they uh, have a contract that he's working once a week but then you have a cart that is um say it's a hazard in between his weekly run is there going to be a backup plan for uh, city staff to uh, still retrieve that cart yes so we we've talked um, to a couple of vendors that do this they they if there is a hazardous like you said hazardous cart they would actually come out and take those up immediately or we could have city crews if it really came down to pick it up so we'd have various they, we did ask that very question because that that was a concern of ours as well as the weekly yeah you, it's a lot of days six days between car, car retrieval so, so so there'd be that they had that option for sure to come out and do that the small there was a much smaller cost if we had if it was just for because they were already serving the area one of the retailers has north glen and commerce city just curious how would you uh perceive the, the getting that information is that for somebody uh, makes a phone call, reports it to you, and you log it in and, and then uh, give that information to the contractor? Or does the contractor have a requirement that they have to cruise a certain amount of the uh, city to uh, lo look for in, in known places? So great question, all of the above. So um, the way the contractor would be looking for the city, the question to give what the city limits are, but we'd also, we also currently have a, uh, we actually keep a, a mapping system that actually shows where carts currently are when we get reports of them, or please find them. So we can, we, we work directly with the contractor saying here, you got some carts here to pick up. So most of the carts we found the last couple of weeks were in Ward 1. There's a few that were outside of that, but we, so we know where the concentration areas are for sure, which will help with costs because we know where certain areas are. Um, that certainly keeps the uh, surveillance area lower. Um, another thing we're, we'll be doing is reaching out to the apartment complex owners and just having them encourage them at least get the carts into the sidewalk so the contractor can get those as well. But yeah, there would certainly be an option to get immediate response to any carts that are in hazardous areas. Well, if we if put an ordinance in there, I guess I would want to make sure that uh, we are not trying to make the uh, vendors or the businesses look like the bad guys because they're the victims. Yep. And that that and that's what they felt like. And I, uh, <clears throat> they they felt like a lot of communities treat them like they're they're the ones that cause the problem, uh, and very punitive in some of the charges to some community charges too. So, the questions before I go to the next slide, Justin. Okay. Yeah. So, I guess for me, the thing that is the most important here is that we remove these carts. And if so, my question is. Do you think this proposal alternative will result in all the carts being picked up or more carts being picked up? Much more carts picked up, not all. Okay. So you, you think this, and what's the biggest, is it the, the coordination with the 
stores what's the big x factor here and in 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 change so you know going back we like it's, we've met with the retailers on four occasions and one of that was that quick engagement is coming to what makes a common sense approach and for them is yes we want to go look outside and get our carts back but they're uh and they have reacted to it. I, I can tell you at least two re, two retailers since we've had this discussion when we got their own contractor circling out cards because they went back to their regional office and said, hey, we've got a problem with Thornton. We need to start doing some work. Um, and they showed photos and they started picking them up where they had in the past. So, um, so they made that a priority. So, but to get 100%, it's going to be very, you know, we can get as close as we can with the sure. rock with the retailers and with the city opt in process. That okay. Helped. Yeah, I understand. We're not going to be able to get all of them, but if you, if your team thinks that this is going to Im improve um, our cart situation, then I will support it. You know, there, there, as long as we can, you know, be flexible and evolve the policy as it works and or doesn't work, um, because it's certainly an issue in our city and. Um, it would improve the quality of life. So, so as long as you guys are confident that this is going to help get those carts back where they belong, then I will support this. On next slide. <laughs> uh, so this slide is showing, uh, so I did extensive research with uh, other communities within the, along the front range for the most part. Uh, various, everybody kind of does it a little bit differently. Uh, most have their employees go out and retrieve carts. But they're all kind of knowing the kind of the X factors you are putting your employees at, at some level of risk of uh, safety of picking up well, obviously a heavy car and putting it back in the truck, being in the right of ways, things along those lines as well. So they're they're looking at options very similar and engaging the retailers. And we heard the retailers are saying the same thing. They're hearing from a lot of communities right now. Um, when it comes to uh, some communities, uh, some communities are imposing fines on their, their retailers. Um, for example, Lone Tree currently charges $1,000 per day if you haven't picked up your cart within 48 hours, and they impound the carts as well. So you'll get it. So they do they do have a lot of carts because $1,000, as I mentioned before, uh, 400 to 1000 is about their average price. So if you left your cart there a couple of days, they may not pick them up. Uh, they're, they're kind of the extreme. Other ones just charge a regular, like a civil citation fine, $150, three, 500 bucks, things along those lines. Um, in those cases, the retailers are very responsive for the most part in picking up their cards because they don't have those fines, but uh, but they are it's, but it is a corporate concern for them to have those kind of have that kind of over their head is they they've been their minds are victimized now they're not only the, the city's not actively going after those who are taking the cards they're just going after the retailers some are going after looking for the individuals that are taking cards and then try to cite those people that is very difficult to do. Um, there are various reasons, and the, often the retailers tell us they don't look for prosecution either, because they'll have somebody that just happens to live in the apartment complex next door, and they're, they have disability or something along those lines that keeps them from bringing the cart back, and they don't want to go after people like that. Or they're unhoused folks, too, and they feel that's not really uh, beneficial to them. But, um, but that's kind of how the pendulum ride. I did have a conversation with the city manager, our, uh, Arvada, weeks ago, and they're considering a very similar ordinance to this. Uh, they actually reached out to me when they when they heard we were looking at an opt-in opt out because they, they were, they're definitely interested in that option. Um, they're also looking at having a vendor go out and pick up mattresses and couches as well, which is another nuisance they have. Uh, it's a little different. They don't have a city run trash hauler like we do, like the city does, but uh, but they were looking at that as well. So they're going to be doing a very similar process with the council having discussions as well. Uh, but they are looking to definitely get the carts back. Uh, they also have a, a problem there downtown in Arvada. It's a bunch of uh, just accumulation of that kind of activity. So their retailers have been very concerned about what their downtown looks like. So from there, uh, staff does recommend uh, amending the code, adding a new division five uh, within the chapter eight, which is the nuisance part of the code to add abandoned shopping carts as a public nuisance and then require the owners to retrieve the, their property, which is in this case, the carts and offer a higher city contractor or current carts to the restore establishments. Or we can keep the existing process, which essentially code compliance, uh, picking up the carts and returning to the vendors. Um, 
and have the retailers hopefully pick them up. Is there any objection to number one? I just have one, uh, one quick question. Go ahead. So they, they, if they opt out, they're required to have their own program. <coughs> and they, they can participate in ours. There's no third option, is that correct? Well, that was what was discussed earlier. The third option would be some type of uh, impoundment lot. Right. Okay, if, if, if we, we can- So right now we're hoping we're going with this binary choice, right? That's, that's the yeah, that's the Goldilocks approach because that's that's we're really getting we're getting the city cleaned up. We're not creating it. We can create our own blight by having a city right. impound lot. I just wanted, which, okay, thank which, you. Which is a concern I had because I saw some photos of some uh, city of California that had just a, a lot of cars that were just didn't look great themselves because they keep them in areas that are where most of the con concentration of cars are anyway. So thank you. But it's definitely an issue. Would be open to adding that if that's council's for. The council would like to have the, the impound aspect as well. Right. Yeah, Randy, do you mind? I, I know there's several questions about um, how do we enforce this, and I think that's something we're going to have to look at as as a violation of uh, Chapter 38 as a public nuisance. We can enforce it under that. We prefer not to, quite honestly. We'd rather this work work out that the retailers are interested enough in saving the money that they would be willing to participate. If they don't, we're going to have to go to a plan where we're where we're enforcing it through through a monetary means. Thank you very much. Yes, thanks. Thank you. All right, that is the last item of the agenda. We have a few minutes for the formal meeting. Any items that council wants to bring forward? Oh, I have a really easy one. Looking ahead, loving resolutions. This May is Mental Health Support Month, Awareness Month. Anybody know? Anyway, I think I think not. I would. I just think we as a city should acknowledge that. Just looking ahead, a couple of weeks, doing that at the end of this month, maybe it's the April twenty third meeting or something, going into Mental Health Awareness Month. Yeah. Question: Is it always or traditionally up to the council members to? bring items that we shine light on, or is that something that we can direct if there's a you know, top three can, monthly, just allow we can us- put to together a list and have council agree to it as a whole in general. Traditionally, we haven't done very many, which is why everybody just brings them up individually. I, give them, I think with all the costs out there, there's probably usually at least one a month that's worth recognizing. Mm -hmm. um, Do you want to put together a list and bring it forward for the, for the year? No, I was I was thinking we yeah. could ask staff to bring us a list and we can. I can start working on one unless you want unless somebody is passed. I'll do a spreadsheet and then I can like forward it to staff or something. They can see a bit more because there's also um, Asian American and Pacific Islander hey. Heritage Month next month. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so. we'll keep it you know, high level, not like right. Not every little thing. <laughs> Donut <laughs> month. Yeah, yeah. but. You know things that are things that dirty. mean something to us would be helpful, and then that way we don't have to individually try to remember what every month is or present every other meeting. And maybe Kristen, we have a list of all the ones we've done over the last couple of years would be helpful too. That's true. Anything else? No, that was it for right now. Thanks, Roberta. Oh, just the Asian American and Pacific Islander okay. Heritage Month for May first <laughs> through the May thirty first. Okay, we did that one last year, so we should have a template for it. Already. Yeah, yeah, that's an important one. Mayor, just for clarification, was there a consensus to start working on those two, or do you want to wait for the overall list? Uh, yes, because May is coming up quickly to go ahead and work on those two, but then I'll, at the same time, put the list together. Thank that's you. what I heard from the council. All right, any other items? I have one. Uh, North Glen had a town hall last week to discuss the transitional housing project that was coming forward. They have asked, and so has uh, Representative Wilford, to put a letter together in support of North Glen's efforts to be more collaborative, what was it, partnership over preemption, the theme that CML has right now, to talk about how the state can work better with you, with cities when they put something like that in the city, because they were not notified until after the property was already purchased and it was already started. And so I forwarded you all a copy of the letter that North Glen wrote. If we could have staff create draft a letter that could come from us because obviously our perspective is a little different. It's not in our city. We are a neighbor, but there is the preemption piece that is important to us as one of our uh, resolutions tonight will be about. So if, if 
council's okay with that if we could get a letter that we could sign and get to quickly because Jenny's trying to do a last minute bill at the at the house in order to address the concerns related specifically to sexual offenders. No problem. Yeah, thanks. I think we should support that. Record. Okay, and you were copied on that email, Brett, as well as the rest of your senior staff. So <laughs> thank you. We'll get on it. All right. Anything else? We see we see you in chambers at seven o'clock.